here. Um, so I, I've got a little presentation, which I hope will give you some uh, some background and some insight into the Niagara Independent and, and how it started and uh, you know what it's all about and what it's not about. Um, and uh, and you know kind of where I, I see it going from here, and so we'll just uh, kind of dive right in. Uh, Duncan gave you a little bit um, bit of a background, um, so I won't spend a lot of time on this. But uh, you know, sort of who is this guy and why is he here? Um, so I ended up in Niagara. I, I've been here for uh, gosh, probably twenty. A little over 20 years now. Uh, I was born and raised in, in Sarnia and uh, not sure how many people know where that is, but <laughs> another border city with Port here in Michigan and uh, ended up going to uh, Brock University and, and was one of the few, I guess, who ended up at Brock from outside of Niagara and stayed. Um, Duncan mentioned one of the sectors I worked in was professional sports and uh, that was with some of you may recall the St. Catherine Stompers, which was a Class A uh, affiliate of the Toronto Blue Jays at the time, and uh, so that was my that was my first uh, real public relations gig. Uh, from there, I went on to the uh, the Shaw Festival Theater. So you can imagine what a seamless transition that was from professional sports to professional theater, uh, and, and then spent the most most of my time in healthcare, about 15 years at the old Hotel du Hospital, which uh, sadly is no longer there. Uh, and then the, the Hotel du Shaver uh, across from, from Brock University. Um, and uh, so spent a little time at the Niagara Peninsula Conservation Authority and then was um, headhunted, I guess you would say, uh, for, a, for a position with the Electrical Contractors Association of Ontario. Um, and you know, probably my ego got the got the best of me, and, and thought, "Geez, this this provincial organization, big fancy office building out by Pearson Airport, um, what a great opportunity!" Uh, and and quickly realized that uh, that that drive was uh, a little more daunting um, after a while, particularly in the winter time. And, and so it became a bit of a quality of life issue. You know, you end up missing a lot of things that your kids are participating in, and, you know, two, two and a half hours sometimes to get home. And God forbid there's an accident on the Burlington Skyway and that's closed. As some of you have probably experienced in, in your life, um, it's not fun. So, I, you know, I, I, I decided to, to make a change and, 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 uh, see what what else i could do and and started doing some con, some public relations consulting and that was going you know fairly well and and had some some clients and doing some work but i kind of kept hearing uh especially from a lot of the business leaders in niagara frustration um once tour star uh obviously the owners of Toronto star um took over uh, in a media shakeup a few years ago all of the Niagara daily and weekly papers, essentially. So there's a bit of a monopoly. And there was a bit of a frustration from some of the folks I was speaking to and sort of the, the negative tone towards business. And they thought, you know, which is, I kept hearing, wouldn't it be great if there was another news option um, in, in Niagara? And so long story short, I thought, geez, maybe there's an opportunity here. And um, talked to a few folks and uh, there's some people interested in advertising and so uh, about two and a half years ago um, launched uh, maybe not quite two and a half launched the Niagara Independent and um, so uh, you know I'll, I'll get to that in in just a second um, on the next slide a little bit more uh, but I just wanted to address the, the the two quick bullet points on here um, as Duncan mentioned, uh, my my twelve uh, soon to be thirteen year old uh, daughters uh, will be heading into grade eight on Friday, uh, which scares me a little bit. But um, uh, great kids, and uh, certainly the two things as Duncan said that that I'm most proud of um, the overcoming challenges and the, the picture you see on your screen here. This this um, actually. Uh, hangs in a waiting room uh, at, at McMaster University Medical Center in Hamilton uh, in their Center for Digestive Diseases. Um, but 
Oh goodness, about 11 years ago, um, I ended up, um, and this is why I include the Ironman stuff, by the way, I'm, I certainly don't win the races and, and I'm not the fastest guy out there by any stretch. Um, but about 11 years ago, I was feeling some symptoms and got quite sick and bouncing around from a few doctors and ending up with, uh, thankfully, a specialist in Oakville and then in, in Hamilton at McMaster Center for Digestive Diseases. I was diagnosed with ulcerative colitis, which is similar to Crohn's disease, if any of you have heard of that. Uh, but uh, at the time, um, you know, I, my first appointment with my specialist, he just he flipped through my chart, which was probably about a foot thick at this point, and kind of looked at me and said, I, I don't think you have any idea how sick you are. Um, I was never a real big guy to begin with, but I probably went from about 165 to about 120 pounds. Um, basically, I had to rest walking up a flight of stairs. Um, I needed blood transfusions, iron injections. So it was a, it, it was a tough go for a while. And so, um, you know, I thought if I started with a little 5K race in Hamilton and kind of worked my way up from there and, and uh, you know, four uh, Ironmans later, I was supposed to do Mont Blanc this year, again, as a fundraiser for, for Hamilton Health Sciences. But uh, unfortunately with COVID, like many things, uh, all the races were canceled this year. So. Um, that just sort of explains um, that that photo. So I say a, a fish swimming upstream because there's 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 a trend for a number of years, and it's growing more so uh, with mainstream media companies, you know, struggling financially. Where you'll see a lot of um, former journalists launching into uh, public relations careers and being hired as public relations consultants or specialists, media relations consultants, um, et cetera. And I, I'm sort of the, the opposite where, you know, 20 years, 20 plus years as a public relations professional now uh, getting into the media side of things and owning a, an online news site. Um, and, I, and I touched on the local monopoly on media and and so that's kind of how this came about and you know it wasn't um you know some people look at it and say it's it's you know conservative leaning um i i don't like to put a political slant on it at all it's pro nag or it's pro business um we try and tell the stories that uh, you, you may not find in mainstream media and that's not to discredit uh the other local media outlets in Niagara, I think they do a good job in, in what they do, and they've been doing it for a long time. Um, you know, when we first started, you know, I took some heat, uh, particularly from one uh, journalist in the area. The others were very supportive, you know, who, who said that, you know, it's not true journalism. It's a conservative shill, all this kind of stuff. Uh, you know, basically, it's not exactly what say the St. Catherine standard is. And my response was always, well, of course, I'm not gonna do the exact same thing that somebody else is doing that to me, that's pretty bad business planning. We wanna offer something a little different. Um, you know, the facts and the information and the articles are true. Um, and we try and write about things that other people aren't writing about, try and put a shine a light on, on some successful business stories and other stories in Niagara. And uh, you know, show show the other side, or or discuss, uh, point out things that uh, perhaps other outlets um, aren't. And so that's just kind of the, you know, the gist of of how that started. Um, you know, what I've learned really quick is uh, every every news outlet though does have a bias, um, and and I think most. You know, credible news outlets will will often ad admit to that. There's a bit of a liberal slant or a conservative slant, or maybe a further left or a further right, whichever you may have. Um, I find this. I use this slide. Uh, a friend of mine actually had it in a presentation on media training, and they're actually the exact same article, uh, but you can see the the difference. Uh, the Toronto Sun headline is, as you can see, his PM optimistic in his message. This is when uh, Harper was prime minister and the Toronto star Harper warns of difficult days ahead. Uh, you know, so whether it's the headline, the photo that's used, the, the you know, the quotes that are, are selected, 
every news outlet, uh, you know, conscious or subconscious certainly has a bias in how they re report the stories. And, and I was actually a senior editor at the Toronto Star one time I heard say, you know, absolutely the Toronto Star is biased. Uh, when we select what photo to use, we're being biased. When we select who to choose to interview, we're being biased. And what quotes to put in, we're being biased. So um, that's why I always encourage people very grateful that people read the Niagara Independent, but also read the Globe and Mail, read the National Post, um, read the St. Catherine Standard, uh, you know, get a good cross section and, and form your opinions. And I think somewhat, uh, unfortunately, due to social media and, and algorithms and news that's pushed out in front of people, a lot of people are only getting one side of their news these days. And, and uh, certainly on, on the internet of things that uh, that those you can't always trust what you read online or on Facebook or on Twitter. Um, and so I always encourage people to to get their news from a variety of sources. Um, I touched on this um, uh, earlier. Um, you know that and I, I'll just add that, you know, this changing face of media and an in industry turned upside down. Um, one of the things I, I find you know, frustrating is, um, you know, certainly the, I, I think local journalism, local media is important. I don't want to see news outlets close, uh, no matter who, if they've been around a hundred years or, or a hundred days. Uh, but I'm also not a fan of, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars in, in bailouts from, from the government. I think, uh, you know, it's kind of tough and, and I'll use this government it happens to be a liberal government could have been any party but when you give you know 600 million dollars out to local media uh i'm not sure how easy it is for those local media outlets to all of a sudden write very critical investigative journalism to the government and just cut you a check for maybe 100 or 200 million dollars so that you can survive um my only criticism of mainstream media that's been around for decades and decades is that, you know, they seem to be the only uh, businesses that didn't see the impact of the internet uh, and social media would have on their business. I mean, most other businesses either adopted, pivoted, uh, changed their business strategy, or they're not around anymore. Um, and they didn't get a lot of government handouts, if any. And so, you know, I think, um, it's a slippery slope when when businesses see something come in and fail to adapt and just turn to uh, to the to the taxpayer uh, to get money to bail them out. Uh, nobody's handed the Niagara Independent any money. And, and, and you know, I'm, we're bent to, to make it on our own. And, and if we do great, uh, if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. And we we gave it our best shot. And uh, that's that's how we look at things uh, on our end. Uh, so that's for those of you who haven't been to the site, um, that's uh, just put this up. So a, a bit of a layout. Um, so typically we have about, um, you know, 99% of the time, seven articles. Uh, it comes out every Tuesday and Friday morning. Uh, you can subscribe. And it's free. You, uh, we don't, uh, you know, sell or give our, our email list away to anybody whatsoever. Uh, the only additional thing you may receive from us maybe once every couple of years is a um, a survey uh, to let us know. Our, we want to know what the readers think. Do you like the articles? Do you wish there was more of this or more of that or less of this or less of that? Uh, the layout, is the site easy to navigate, et cetera? And so what those seven articles contain is uh, usually there's two local stories. Uh, there's a federal story, a provincial story. A sports a story, business, and opinion. And if I did my math right, uh, that'll, that'll add up to seven. Um, and you, you can see uh, at the top here, uh, we've changed the navigation a, a little bit uh, just recently, uh, but uh, there they are there. And then you just click on the article <clears throat> and it'll, it'll move to the next, uh, the next, next page. So, as Duncan mentioned, um, we have about 12,000 subscribers. As I said, it's emailed 
twice weekly, Tuesday and Friday mornings, the content uh, I went over. Some of the contributors, uh, this is where I think I've been very, very fortunate um, to have a roster of, of writers and, and it is original content, by the way. Um, every once in a while, we have a relationship with some writers that um, may publish an opinion piece. You may see first in the Globe and Mail, uh, but we've been given the rights to run uh, those commentary pieces in the Niagara Independent as well. But aside from that, it's all original uh, content. Catherine Swift is the, the former CEO of uh, the Canadian Federation of Independent Business. She's an economist. She covers the uh, provincial side of things. Um, Janet Ecker, former uh, Minister of Finance, Minister of Education, Minister of Housing, I believe, and Social Services at one point, uh, under Mike Harris government, uh, writes a, a column once a month. Uh, Kate Harrison is based out of Ottawa. Uh, her and Chris George, um, they they cover uh, what's happening in Ottawa. They cover the federal uh, politics uh, in this country. Uh, Mark Keeley is a former uh, advisor to uh, former Prime Minister John Turner and, and runs a very successful uh, public relations. Uh, Mark's a, a big liberal, um, uh, and and so. We'd like to have his opinion there as well. Kelly Harris um, is uh, is in Alberta right now, but an, an Ontario guy, and he writes once a month an opinion piece. He spent a lot of time in the financial sector uh, as a government relations, uh, public relations professional. Brock Dick Dickinson writes uh, business and um, uh, entrepreneurial economic type articles. Uh, he was. Uh, launched what has now become Canada's largest economic development consulting firm. Um, he sold his portion of that and is now uh, a professor at University of Waterloo and, and doing uh, his own consulting stuff as well. Rod Mahood covers sports, a uh, well-known sports guy locally. Uh, Mark Tui is interesting. Uh, some of that, that name may ring a bell to some of you. He was actually um, Rob Ford's chief of staff when uh, the late uh, Rob Ford was mayor of Toronto. So some interesting stories. Mark uh, writes from time to time. And Jasmine Moulton is uh, with the Canadian Taxpayers Federation. And, and there's a few others that I've left out. Uh, I write most of the local stories. Um, still looking to get uh, somebody to kind of cover the local news. But for right now, that's me. And, and uh, But that's also been a lot of fun because I get to frankly, meet a lot of people, speak to a lot of people, learn about a lot of industries and businesses I normally wouldn't. And, uh, and so that's been, that's been a lot of fun. Uh, we also cover regional and some of the city council stuff as well. And, uh, you know, one of the big focuses is, is the potential increase, significant increase in taxes to Niagara. Um, you know, this regional council is, uh, there's been some pretty big tax increases, not only at the region, but the region combined with the local municipality as well. And so, you know, sometimes that kind of flies under the radar. So we want to make sure that people are aware of what's going on. So what it's not, it's not a blog. It's not fake news. Um, it's simply, like I say, pro business, pro Niagara. And we, we try and get some interesting articles out that you may not see elsewhere. In terms of uh, the future of, of Niagara Independence, um, we are looking uh, at expansion um, in talks with some folks in the Kitchener-Waterloo area to launch what would probably be called, unless I can come up with a better name, the Kitchener-Waterloo Independent uh, and also the London Independent. Um, again, some of those areas uh, where we can bring a, a new, fresh voice to local media. Um, and the one of the, the thoughts I've been had circling around in my small brain over since I started this is could this be a chance for the first, I think the first bi-national news site. Uh, and I've I've chatted with a few people about this and and they seem to think I'm onto something in terms of, you know, sort of half the news is what's going on on this side of the border in Niagara, and the other half would be what's going on in in, you know, Niagara Falls, New York, Buffalo, New York, and, and that side of the border. And I think there's some interesting 
potential there. Uh, there's a lot of work. Uh, people obviously aren't crossing the border right now, but there's a lot of work going on, uh, a lot of shared projects that, that many people don't know about. And, you know, I, I like to think that some of the business leaders and political leaders in, in Niagara would be interested in reading about some of the success stories that have happened on the other side of the border in terms of growing their economy, uh, creating jobs, uh, et cetera, and vice versa. Some of the people on the U.S. side would be looking over here and at some of our success stories uh, as well. So I, I throw this up because uh, as someone who's, you know, worked behind the scenes in a public relations capacity and then has written the media releases and written speeches for others to say and, and always sort of liked being uh, sort of in the shadows behind the scenes and not a public figure. It was uh, a, a bit of a shock at the beginning. Uh, you know, certainly there was those who wanted to shout down the Niagara dependent and as as many of you know, there's people can say some pretty awful things online. Uh, it took me a while to grow some thicker skin, but um, you know, this is one of the quotes that I often refer back to. And, you know, I've over the last year, just sort of let these things roll off my back. Although I will say, uh, I'm very pleased that most of the comments and the dialogue, particularly on the Facebook page for the Niagara Independent, um, has been pretty good and, and pretty respectful. Um, you know, we, we won't stand for anything that's personal attacks or lots of swear words or you know, just ignorant, um, rude commentary that insults people. That's that's not what we're about. Um, nor will we write articles personally attacking people. I just don't believe in that. Let's talk about issues. Let's talk about policy, and and have good, healthy debates uh, on those those topics. And because I think that's where you you get to an end that um, is a win win for for everybody. So uh, again, thank you for for having me. I, I tried to go through that uh, hopefully um, not not overly quick, but uh, I also know want to let people get on with their day, and I'm and I'm happy to to answer any questions you may have. Unmute, and if 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 you want to ask Kevin any questions. Kevin and uh, Russ Milan, uh, is your primary revenue to make your operation function from advertisers? Is much yeah, that's a good point. And it's it's actually, as I was going through the slides this morning, I, I meant to put that in there because I realized I've sort of left that piece out. Um, but I was afraid to screw something up. So I, <laughs> I, I left the presentation the way it was. But so there's three sort of primary sources of revenue. Uh, you're right, advertising is one. Um, uh, well, there's a there's a donate option on the site, uh, and people have been been generous that way. I mean, it's everything from five dollars to, uh, frankly, five hundred dollars, uh, and everything in between. Um, and so we're we're grateful for that support. And then we don't have a lot, but we do use Google Ads as well. You may see sometimes on the site. And, uh, you know, one of the more common comments we had in our, our original survey we did about a year ago uh, from people was that they like that the site's very clean, it's easy to follow, and there isn't a lot of these pop-up ads where you're reading an article and all of a sudden there's a, you know, a loud video of, of Ford trying to sell you a pickup truck uh, that pops up. Um, so we don't, we don't have the video, but, um, just in a couple of spots, you may see um, a Google ad, but uh, those are the, kind of the three main sources. And it's, you know, it's always a, a struggle and a fight to to keep to keep that revenue. So far, you know, we're generating enough to to pay the writers and and uh, uh, to pay myself a little bit. But uh, yeah, it's 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 not easy. That's that's for sure. The other, one other comment, Russ Bland, it's me, I will make is that I did check out 
the fact that he also has a really nice Facebook page where you can easily read all these news items on the Facebook page, or you can go to his website and read it. But the other thing that he did, which is good, most some places don't do this, is he has, if you have your cell phone and you uh, access his website, it's beautifully, neatly presented on your cell phone, so it's very readable. No little tiny print or any of that kind of stuff. So here, there's my, I have no interest in his business, <laughs> but there's my push <laughs> for what he's done. It's really neat. Thank Any you. other questions or comments? Just hold the space bar and speak. Yeah. Hi, it's it's Duncan. Can I ask a question? Hello. Yeah, go for it, Duncan. Yeah. Okay. Um, Kevin, you've yes. mentioned your pro business. And one of the thoughts that I had was if you could refer to one or two businesses in St. Catharines, Niagara, that you feel is one of the uh, really positive ones that have dealt with and are dealing with the COVID-19 difficult situation. Could you refer to one or two and give an example of why you think that they've been that positive and progressive? Sure, uh, that's a good question. Um, I'll, I'll try and give a couple um, from different perspectives. One is um, I wrote an article uh, some of you, probably many of you may know Calhoun. It used to be called Calhoun Sportswear. I think it's just Calhoun now. Uh, I believe on Bunting Road there. Uh, been around forever. And they're a prime example of, of a company that basically originally just sort of shut down. They laid off all their employees. You know, nobody was coming in and buying T-shirts. Uh, all of the events that they would normally print T-shirts for, whether it be you know, running races or uh, other special events weren't happening. Everything was canceled. So they, they kind of pivoted and it was somebody from a Niagara college had said to one of the owners, geez, can you guys make masks? There's a real shortage of masks. And so, you know, ownership brought in a couple of employees and they started making masks and then they started making more and they brought more employees back. Uh, and, uh, and basically it was sort of up and running and, and, uh, you know, like I say, pivoted their business model uh, for that that time, and you know, I think they're going, still making masks, but going back to their their normal business now that we're in phase three. But um, you know, it's just a great example, and there there are others of, as well and from that aspect that have, you know, really taken the ball and and run with this, uh, and didn't just sort of sit back and fold. Uh, during these tough times, um, geez, other successful that have handled COVID. Um, you know, I think generally speaking, um, the, the private businesses have been hit so hard. And, uh, you know, we wrote a couple of articles and then there's another business group in town and, and Spencer Fox, president of ES Fox, made a presentation to regional council just saying, look, you know, we want to help municipal regional governments. Um, our understanding is the region, for example, didn't lay off a single employee. Uh, not that these folks want to see layoffs, uh, but they kind of just kept on as business as normal. And meanwhile, a lot of Niagara businesses were just devastated. And, uh, you know, so their fear was that there's going to be these massive tax increases on people that couldn't afford it. And, and so, I, you know, good, good for some of these folks for kind of stepping up and, and, you know, Spencer is very clear saying, we're not trying to tell the region what to do. We want to lend our, our expertise and years of experience in business to kind of help, uh, the municipalities in the region stick handle this and go through it. So you're not left to either raising taxes or begging for money from the federal or provincial governments. Um, and so, you know, good for them, good on them for doing that. I don't think it was, I'm not sure how much feedback they've had or if there's been any follow-up meetings, unfortunately. Um, but, you know, I think you've seen a lot of Niagara businesses do the best they can. And, and unfortunately, I hate to say it, but the worst might be ahead. You know, I think a lot of the, the restaurants, 
once the weather gets cold and sitting on a patio isn't a viable option, it's going to be really, really interesting to see how many can kind of come out the other side through the winter time. And I will say too, despite some of, you know, social media and traditional media coverage of what you've seen in Clifton Hill, I think the tourism folks in Niagara Falls have, have done a good job. I, I find it, and I'm actually going to write about this on Friday. Personally, I find it odd that there seems to be these attacks on, you know, the mayor or the council or, or the tourism operators or the tourism sector leaders. When to me, it's, you know, they're providing the hand sanitizing, they're providing the mask, they've got everything marked out in their business, what's six feet apart. It, it, at some point, the ownership, uh, the responsibility has to be with the people that are visiting Niagara Falls and the Niagara region and Clifton Hill to do their part. You know, the mayor, it's not his responsibility to go down there and make sure every single person is uh, following the rules. And short of closing up, you know, basically the largest tourist destination in the country, uh, which would be devastating to a number of families in the local economy, uh, you know, I think they're doing the, the best they can under the circumstances. Thank you. Kevin, I wonder if you can shut off your screen uh, sharing just so we can see more people. Thanks. Oh, sure. Sorry. I have a comment for Kevin. Rob Castleman here. Hi, Dr. Castleman. Hi there. Kevin, your uh, your reference to uh, the Hotel Du brought back some memories to me, of course. I was uh, involved with that, and uh, I'm sure that was a trying time for PR for a person in your position. Uh, I was the chief of surgery in those days at the Du. I know. Uh, when Dennis Timbrell came down, it, <laughs> sent, it sent a shockwave through the medical staff. And uh, I always thought, and today particularly, I was uh, thinking back how uh, what a challenging time that must have been for you and PR and promoting the, the cause of the Hotel Du, uh, because we really had such a great organization and to see it threatened and so on, this restructuring was uh, quite a challenge. So that, that's an interesting part of your history, I found. That, thank you, Dr. Castleman. And I, I heard that you were part of this group and I was wondering if you were going to be on this call because I remember, certainly remember seeing you in the hallways and uh, I think maybe we did a little fundraising uh, for a piece of equipment for, for the ORs uh, when you were there, but uh, uh, it's, it's great to see you because you always were such a, a, uh, such a great guy anytime I had to deal with you and uh, especially given how busy you were. So, um, but yeah, it was, it was definitely um, a very stressful time. Uh, as you know, sir, the, being the, uh, the physician, uh, they don't, there's no known cause for, for colitis or Crohn's disease, but I'm certainly convinced that stress uh, plays a role in, in flaring it up. And that was, um, that was when it was at its worst, when, when all that was going. on. I can believe that for sure, Kevin. Yeah. And just to add, you know, it's funny when, when all that was happening and there was sort of this hotel do versus St. Catherine's general just before the Niagara health system formed. And there's people said, you know, I'll just have one one hospital or one organization run both. And and personally, I always felt that there was a healthy competition between the two hospitals. And I I always felt that that was a good thing because you know each ER department or ED department wanted to be the best. And and you know each you know the the ORs wanted to be the best and, and each tried to strive to provide the best care. And I always thought that was a good thing. So things didn't get kind of complacent when, you know, using that word monopoly again, there was a monopoly on healthcare uh, in the region and, and one organization runs everything. Uh, and I'm not saying the Niagara Health System does a bad job at all, but I always thought, you know, maybe, maybe giving people a choice of which hospital to go to uh, kind of pushes the staff and the management at each to to be really, really good at what they do. That's quite true. And I think at that in those days there there was a wave, it was a political wave really, to uh to integrate and to uh, organize things so that uh, 
it would be under one unit. And you're quite right that those two hospitals could have coexisted. They each had uh, specialized in specific uh, venues, and uh, but it was difficult to see it happen. But it was a sign of progress and moving on, and we all had to adjust to change. So those were interesting times for you. It's interesting to hear that today. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you, everyone. Uh, Duncan, could I get you to thank Kevin on our behalf, please? Right. right. Thank you, thank Kevin. You. Um, my take from your presentation, which I enjoyed very much, uh, was three things. Uh, first of all, your comment about fish swimming upstream. I think it's very appropriate, whether it was your disease that you <laughs> fought or whether it's monopolies. Uh, the only suggestion I would make, which of course you won't do uh, for, um, uh, for personal reasons is I would say fish swimming successfully upstream. Um, so I know you wouldn't uh, promote yourself that uh, blatantly, but I think it, it's appropriate. The second thing is that you wanna offer a different fact uh, option positive and, and show the other side is a very relevant point. Um, and uh, I do read a number of different uh, medias and I do agree with you that having different perspectives is important. And finally, um, good cross section to form opinions is excellent. So thank you for your presentation. It was very enjoyable and I will be mailing you a gift certificate uh, on behalf of Probus and uh, appreciate it very much and looking forward to reading your, your Niagara Independent. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me, gentlemen. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, our meeting is uh, going to continue on for just a little while longer. Uh, but, uh...